Then we'll game number one and see how this goes. All right. Uh, it's a big match. I'm really excited for this one. Likewise. Oh, Lindsay right. on the line here. Let's take a look at these opening hands. Not too shabby from both sides of things. Yeah, and this is a really nice one with uh, Gabrielle Nassif being on the play, it looks like. So no matter what, you can lead with an innkeeper and then for sure at least get one trigger with a giant killer if you really need to before, you know, the world of stomps comes <laughs> into play, which we do see a ton in Sassan. Yeah, so Seth is kind of also playing the adventure plan there, but just with a slightly different top end. Exactly, exactly. Slightly different color when it comes to getting rid of white for showdown and giant killer and just adding in some uh, comas. But otherwise, you know, it has that same core of the deck where, believe it or not, Edgewall Innkeeper, Bone Crusher Giant, Love Struck Beast, and the rest of Throne of Eldraine is pretty dang good. <laughs> yeah, they're still representing very well in standard at the moment. As uh, the turn passes back, just a triumph down on the battlefield for Seth Manfield. Fabled Passage is the draw for an Asif. He was going to go for the Pillar Verge pathway and the Giant Killer, like you mentioned, to get that card off of the Edgewall Innkeeper before it meets its inevitable end in Stomp. Yeah, absolutely. Not a bad pickup there with the Jaspera Sentinel off the Giant Killer, allowing um, Nassif to add three mana next turn, maybe a fourth if we get an untapped land that isn't a Fabled Passage, to possibly crank out Showdown as early as turn three and really start the aggro plan going. Most of the time, you really want to soak up all the value you can with Showdown. But in some of these matchups where your opponent is doing such a bigger, over-the-top thing, sometimes you just want to get it down, get those counters going, and uh, do your best. So Storm takes care of the Jaspera Sentinel there. Uh, Seth Manfield not wanting any additional ramp happening on this battlefield. So Gabnasif gets to get another card here if he so chooses, and that's what he's going to do with the Bone Crusher Giant being cast. Yeah, that's a true decision there and a true cost to leave Edgewall Innkeeper around. Seth just kind of realizing that, you know, I have that other Bone Crusher Giant to be able to deal with Edgewall Innkeeper. One extra card is not that big of a deal, but really trying to play around a showdown there, not making sure Nassif could not get four mana there. So smart play by Seth. Yeah, and we've seen different approaches with the showdown of the Skulls from different players. Mm -hmm. Certain players like Nassif, tend to wait a little bit longer to get it out. Other players, we saw like uh, LSV yesterday, I believe. Yep. He got it out as early as turn three, as soon as he could, it was on the battlefield. So it, it's always interesting to see how the different players in the different matchups value getting shot out of the scouts down. Exactly. And, you know, who knows? Nassif maybe just plays the exact same way no matter what. Just a man that cannot give up any value. So might just wait till that turn five to cast Showdown and get a land off of it just because who can resist value, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so just the land of war visionary down on the battlefield there for Manfield. Gets an extra card. We'll be able to ramp if it sticks around. Nothing currently that Gab Nassif can do about it, barring tap it down with a giant killer. Yeah, exactly. So we'll see. Maybe if uh, Nassif wants to just play Tangled Florhedron, he could tap with giant killer, or yeah, yeah, tap with the giant killer on the battlefield. That could be an option. Or just get down showdown here. I highly doubt we'll see a Gigantha, but just decides to get chapter two and chapter three ready for that showdown. Ooh, very, very nice find yeah. there from the Shadow of the Skulls. Bone Crusher Giant, Clarion Spirit, a land, and another Shadow of the Skulls. Yeah, that's really good. And, you know, it, it's going to be a tough choice here for Nassif next turn. Do I want to just make sure I have more value coming from Shodan, which equals more counters on my creatures? Or do I want to play something powerful like Clarion Spirit and Bone Crusher Giant, plus get a token, plus two, put two plus one, plus one counters on? A lot of good options for Nassif next turn. I like option number two there. If, uh, I think I do if, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. <laughs> Talk it, about Valley. What more could you like? Exactly. Oh, yeah. And also draw a card thanks to Edgewall Innkeeper on the board. Not bad. Indeed. Not bad. Indeed. We do see that one copy of Disdainful Stroke in the hand of Seth Manfield, but he's recognizing that, you know, this turn is going to be quite nutty indeed for Gavin Asif, who's going to be playing a bunch of cheap spells that are revealed to Seth Manfield. So Disdainful Stroke won't be an option in case of the second shot of the Skulls. Do you think mm -hmm. that changes the decision here for Gavin Asif at all? With not leaving up mana for disdainful stroke, yeah. Do you do do you yeah. think that there's a consideration now? It's like okay, the 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 door's open. Let's go. 
Yeah, you know, there is some consideration to do Showdown now. I would think I still like the other line. It's it's mm -hmm. closer, but especially if Seth were to make the play where he just leaves two mana open and sees the Showdown, one of the very few targets that you actually have against this Nia Adventures deck, then Nasif just goes, okay, well, I'm going to look at your list because they have open deck lists, of course, mm -hmm. and there's no reason to put yourself at an, you know, an unnecessary risk this turn, instead of getting, you know, four, five, six, seven power onto the battlefield, instead you just get something countered. That's just way too bad, and Nasif wouldn't take that risk. Yeah. The Clarion Spirit is going to be the first thing down on the battlefield. We're going to get a bunch of counters here off of Showdown of the Skulls. And, like you mentioned, a flyer in the air, too. As well as an extra counter, so plenty of things to do in this turn. Yeah, I'm wondering if he's going to just stomp the innkeeper or if he's going to just play it. Yeah, that that's an interesting one there. Oh, and I like putting the counter on the clarion spirit as well. Get that out of stomp range. Exactly. Well played there. And now has the option to attack with this Bone Crusher Giant and trade with the Lovestruck Beast. The one thing about this Teamer Luka deck is Luka, which we do see in hand with the mana to cast it, you can't really target a token. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say you can't. You definitely can, and you can try to get a little lucky, but then you could hit Edgewell Innkeeper. You could hit any of the three-drop adventure creatures and not hit the Serpent Coma. That's the biggest deal. But with having that uh, Elvish Visionary in play, you can just sacrifice the Visionary itself, and no matter what, you're going to get that insanely powerful seven-drop, and it's go time right now if... Seth wants to, but the one thing we notice about this coma plan in this matchup and kind of the reason why I think Nia Adventures is favored, you're going to see Gabriel Nassib do exactly this a lot. Leave that giant killer in hand and mm -hmm. just no matter what, never cast it. He could have searched for another white source and played that and drew a card last turn, but there is no way he's going to get rid of that card in his hand because it deals with coma even if he doesn't even have to leave mana open and that's what makes this matchup kind of rough to me is luca will go and it'll sacrifice visionary and then at nasif's upkeep he can just chop it down with the serpent yeah. coming into play and then it's just not that good you know so that's the that's the tricky part of this yeah this is quite a cheeky plan i quite like this the crone war stealing the token generator and following it up with a second spell to get a spirit in the air for his turn. So instead of risking the Luca into coma, like you mentioned, yep. instead goes for the value play. Going to steal your creature that's making other creatures and then force you to deal with it that way. And also, thanks, Nasi, for putting that counter on my creature. How nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to bring some attention to that play right there, because if we look at this game from Seth's perspective, the best thing you can do is put Coma into the battlefield. And he just recognized that, you know what, if Giant Killer's there, this play is bad. It's actively mm -hmm. really bad. So why take that unnecessary risk when you have a really good play that puts you ahead on the battlefield? And now we see Nasif straighten up in his chair. He's like, well, everything was going so great until that turn. Yeah, what what is what is the the line here? Do you think for Nasif? So we can pretty much confidently say that the giant killer is going to hang around. You know, you don't want to yeah. put your guard down for coma coming down. Yeah. And it doesn't draw a card anymore, so that's not that mm -hmm. big of a deal. I'd like to see Gigantha, and you know, decides not to um, to play Bone Crusher. I was kind of thinking play Bone Crusher, put a counter on this one one spirit to at least have a 2-2 attacking in, put mm -hmm. Seth likely to eight. It's not it's not great or amazing, but it looks like Nasif has other plans, maybe tapping down um, one of one of Seth's creatures, but we'll, we'll see what he does. The one one in for one point of damage. Seth Manfield's down to nine, while Gab Nasif remains on 20. And yeah, it looks like we're gonna tap on upkeep so that the line of war cannot be used for mana. Interesting. There is the option to brazen borrow or to petty theft away the token on the other side. Yep. Yeah, you could do that. Chapter two of the Akron War is about to come down, forcing some attacks. This might be the reason why Nasif didn't want to put that Bone Crusher Giant out there because it would be marked for death in a couple of turns <laughs> when it has to attack into the powerful Akron War. Yeah, and it would result in Nasif losing both his creatures in the uh, Clarion Spirit and the Giant. Exactly. And Nasif kind of has to realize that he's going to get his 
Clarion Spirit back. Yeah, actually, now after looking after this play, this was a great play from Nassif because if we play Bone Crusher Giant and it's forced to attack, Seth can just simply block with the Clarion Spirit, which mm -hmm. then Nassif will not get back. So a really heads up play uh, there from Nassif that I did not even see until just now. So really heads up there to not lose both creatures and instead he'll get Clarion Spirit back. So the first thing for Seth Manfield is going to be right. Let's just get the value off of these creatures while I can, because yep. they're gonna they're gonna go back eventually. Is there any consideration then for Luca to come down and munch on that Clarion Spirit just to make sure it doesn't go back to Nasif? Definitely a consideration. It it still could hit a coma. Could still just hit an adventure creature. It's not the worst for sure. This is the only chance Seth will have to get rid of that Clarion Spirit. So if he's mm -hmm. gonna do it, he's gonna do it now. And I like yeah. it. What's he yeah. getting? Spin, Spin the wheels, see what comes out. It is Ooh, a Bone Crusher Giants. Okay, not the worst. Not bad. It's an upgrade. Yeah, and now here is the nice thing. Now that Nassif has taken this more conservative line where he didn't play a lot of things to try to wait out this Akroan war, now Nassif is in kind of a weird little spot where he can't actually get Luka any lower. So Luka can just activate again and get that coma. We know it's going to get that giant killer out of Nassif's hand, but at least you're you're still getting value out of it and you have more comas in your deck. Yeah, so very uh, interesting couple of turns there with that Crow in War, throwing a spanner in the works. There are two Coma Cosmos Serpents in Seth's deck, so if one does die, there is always the opportunity to get another one at a later stage, but we're going to see Giant Killer tap down the Spirit, and the Spirit on the other side of the battlefield go in and whack dear Luca Coppercoat Outcast down a little bit more. Yep, and a nice play there by by Nassif. If he didn't use that giant killer to tap something down, it just would have ran right into Bone Crusher Giant and died. So mm -hmm. uh, a good way to keep that alive. So these two disdainful strokes are a little bit clunky in Seth's hand right now. Doesn't really have very many good options except for this Gigantha. So he might be setting himself up to bounce and then counter that. Yeah, that was actually a really nice petty theft here. Like, Gigantha is the biggest thing that Nassif is really doing. And it's going to be tempting to play that again next turn. And Seth can actually play one of his adventure creatures, sacrifice it or one of the other creatures in play, and have Disdainful Stroke up. Disdainful mm -hmm. Stroke cannot counter the chop down of Giant Killer. That is really what Seth would like to deal with. But, you know... Still still being able to deal with Gigantha or a top deck showdown is still pretty valuable. Yeah. But even at this rate, I mean, Seth's just amassing power on this battlefield. He's yeah. got two Bone Crusher Giants and a Brazen Borrower waiting in the wings. Like, that's a lot of power on the board. So, oh, yeah. you know, Gavin and Steve is going to be forced to react at one point or another. Oh, yeah. Advantage is definitely in Seth's side for sure. Just playing these creatures. Now Nassif has to constantly be wary about what Luca can do here with Coma. And we got to remember, even if this giant killer can kill Coma, it's still going to come with a 3-3 Serpent. And that's adding a little bit more power to the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And if Nassif's strongest card, a 5-5 amongst this battlefield of 3-3s and 4-3s is going to get countered, we might just see this game wrapped up in a couple of turns. Yeah. Seth Manfield being patient, though, just plussing Luca, looking for a card to exile off the top of the library. Unfortunately, <clears throat> doesn't find any creature to cast. But still looking in a very commanding position here with five creatures to one on Gab Nassif's side of the battlefield. Yeah, that was an interesting play. Seth was just like, you know what? I don't want to tax your mana quite yet, right? Because... At Gabe's upkeep, when the coma trigger would go on the stack, that's an extra three mana. And Seth is just like, you know what? I want you to cast Gigantha. So it's kind of like, I dare you. I dare you type mm -hmm. of mood. You know, like cast that <laughs> giant creature. I'll stroke it. And then next turn, he can actually use Luca and then tax Nassif's mana a little bit on his next upkeep. Really smart play there by Seth. Yeah. So looking really good here for Seth Manfield in this first game. Between these two excellent players, here comes Gigantha the Wellspring. Now, you, you've got to smell a disdainful stroke a mile away. Yeah. But what else are you going to do this turn? 
Exactly. Like cast a bone crusher giant and a tangled florhedron. That's not much better. So this, this is just starting to look like there is truly no way back for Nassif. And it looks like we're going to be heading to game number two in favor of Seth Manfield. Very shortly. And uh, giant killer is going to do his best here just to mitigate some of the damage going to make the bone crusher giant sit down as the rest of the team here. I'm going to swing in for six points of damage. Taking the thief down to four. Now I'm curious to see where Luca goes. Are we going to minus on the Lana War visionary? Yes, yes, we are. All righty, let's get the big old Cosmos Serpent out there. Here comes Coma. Each upkeep is going to make Coma's coil. <laughs> Pretty little serpent friend. It's probably going to die on upkeep here before it has the chance to sacrifice one of the Comus coils to give it an indestructible. Exactly. And man, that animation the first time really <laughs> scared me. The first time I saw it, I was yeah. like, what was that? And yeah, then I'm like, all right, this is pretty cool. <laughs> it's pretty terrifying. That one and um terrifying. the the cast off from the giant, the realm realm plug giant, the big yes. hand. Big <laughs> hand that just rips down. Yep. Yeah, that one terrified <laughs> me the first time. Agreed. <laughs> Were you the oh, person man. getting your board destroyed, or were you doing yes. the destroying? Uh, then it's yes. also scary. Then it's mm -hmm. extra scary, really. <laughs> <laughs> What's extra scary right now is uh, the amount of creatures that Gabna Seif has to figure out how to block or tap. And uh, it looks like he'll be able to stay alive. We see another Brazen Borrower coming down. We can tap yeah. one thing. We have three blockers can block the three, four threes. Then we would take six, seven, eight. Yeah, yeah that's there. Yeah, yeah. That's lethal by a lot. Nassif just going through the motions, making sure nothing silly happens, and then we're going to be heading to game number two. Yeah, just way too much power on this battlefield. Who needs a Cosmos Serpent when you've just got a big old bunch of dudes coming across the battlefield? Yep. Nassif is going to do his due diligence and block what he can, but is going to go down in game number one here to Seth Manfield. So we have a good old fight in our hands here, Corey. Yeah, this is a battle. Now we get to these post board games where we got a lot of different things um, to change up a bit. But looking at Nassif's side, I don't really say see a ton of changes to be made. Like maybe uh, the Akron War seems awesome. Uh, just trying to take control of comas like we saw uh, <laughs> my older brother Brad do to Seth just repeatedly um, yesterday in his competition. But outside of that, there's not a ton to change. Uh, Redain pretty bad, bringing in that Akron War and another Fire Prophecy to deal with the Edgewall Innkeepers. And then from Seth's side, just taking out all these blue counter spells. We saw how kind of awkward Disdainful Stroke mm. is in these kind of matchups and just bringing in more removal and even a negate to just deal with that chop down. You know, I yeah. mean, if, if, if that... Disdainful Stroke was a negate. We would have saw Coma on the battlefield a lot sooner, and it would have done a lot more. <laughs> For sure. So we're going to see a very different game play out here, potentially, if these sideboard cards are featured. So let's jump back down to the players and take a look at these opening hands. Very nice opening hand there for Seth Manfield. Great he's got something to do on turn one and turn three, so he's going to be pretty happy with that. Gabna Seif is going to kick things off here with a Jaspera Sentinel, which can help him ramp out or into a Showdown of the Skulls as early as turn three. Yeah, turn three showdown is so good against a lot of matchups here. You know, maybe if Nassif were to find maybe a Lovestruck Beast on turn three, might want to deploy that and wait for that turn four showdown where he can play a land. Uh, but if he doesn't have a play, it's going to be a slam, no-brainer, Showdown of the Skulls on turn three. Giant killer into hand, so that'll help against the big beasties, one of which we've just seen make a 1-1 token on the battlefield. Off on an adventure, love struck goes. And no need for the extra mana right now, so the first Despair Sentinel is just going to swing in there for one point of damage. Yeah, Despair Sentinel, a really underrated card. I mean, one mana, one, two, that has reach, can stop these 1-1 one, one flyers, and then also adds mana. A little a little contextual mana. It's not uh, as powerful as, let's say, Lana War Elf, um, but yeah. still a really powerful card that hasn't seen as much play as I kind of thought. I, I really thought it would be a um, a main player in a, in a ton of decks, but really has only made it in Nye Adventures. Yeah, and it fits really well in, in the archetype, so. It really does, yep. Glad to see it being played. Ooh. Ooh, 
All right. I was I was like, yeah, this edge one keeper is fine until the bone crusher giant was drawn. But now he has an interesting decision. He knows about the love struck beast that can get a card off of the edge one keeper. Yeah. But how tempting is it to get a showdown of the skulls down this turn? It's really tempting here, but if we're going to see this attack all button, Nassif is going to prioritize <laughs> stomping edge while innkeeper, and yep. it's just saying, Seth, do you want to make a really bad block here? No? Okay. Well, I didn't think you would, <laughs> but if there would have been a double block, then we see a stomp, but no real point in doing that. We're just going to see that upkeep stomp on edge while innkeeper to stop any kind of card advantage. And I, I like that play better than showdown yeah. because now next turn you get to showdown and play a land off it and get that max value, which let's get real. All magic players love. Oh yes. <laughs> we love getting the most out of our magic cards. Yes. And the Seth Manfield is going to have to hope for as much as he can to wrap this game up against nine adventures, which has been doing very, very well this weekend. Absolutely. And one thing I want to point out here, I'm counting three lands. I see a land or visionary going up to four lands and a red land and Luca. We could have a mm -hmm. turn for coma. Good news for Nassif fans is we do have that giant killer in our hand and there's not a ton that can be done about it, but it is an option. And we'll see if uh, Seth considers just kind of going all in. This is what the deck does. That's its best draw. Mm -hmm. And up against another deck that just can't deal with it. Let's say, you know, mono red or mono white if they don't have a lot of main deck giant killers, these hyper aggressive decks, that yeah. just wins. That just wins straight up. And that's kind of the appeal to play this deck. When every deck is reacting to you and your coma isn't just an I win button, then it gets a little <laughs> bit more rough and you got to play around it a little bit more. But yeah. Like the previous game, though, Seth Manfield does also have the Akron Wars an option. So depending on yeah. what Nasif deploys here, we could see Seth Manfield just go for that, steal the biggest creature on the board. Exactly. Maybe a Crow in War and kind of set up another turn uh, similar to what he did last game, where he was really patient about Luka um, and, and see if he attacks that way. I'm curious to see what Nassif does with this turn. There is the Bone Crusher Giant. We see the Giant Killer in hand, ready and waiting for a potential coma next turn. I don't know if he can do everything he wants to do this turn if he is waiting or suspecting a coma next turn. Yeah, interesting. Decides to just go with Bone Crusher Giant. And this is that play. We would not have seen... Um, oh, I see. Oh, nice. What he's doing there with all those stops... He's really trying to bluff stomp here and just think, <laughs> you know, if you if you have Luca and you go for it, instead of having to wait until I untapped a giant killer, if I have a stomp on the Elvish Visionary in response, you get nothing. Mm -hmm. And then he gets to attack. So I think that's enough to push Seth into not doing that, right? Like being yeah. safe. So now we really might see that a Crow in War or maybe like a Luca um, and tick up. But I highly doubt we'll see Luca tick down on the visionary. It seems pretty risky into stomp mana. Yeah, that would be that would be a pretty big blowout then. Yeah. And would likely lose the planeswalker on the next turn. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and we we see that, you know, Seth maybe didn't have the best day yesterday, oh. but if you look in the back of his camera, he just has trophy after trophy, world championship trophy. Seth just has won so many events over the years. It's, it's awesome to see his background. Oh, it is. And it's awesome to see this. He is just like, all right, just if you've go got it, it, here, do what you can. Yeah, and I like that. He's just like, you know what? If you had stomp, you would have killed my visionary on turn three. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of just letting me untap, there's no way Nassif wouldn't have just done that. It's what Seth was probably thinking there. So he he came up <laughs> with it. Really, really smart play there by Seth. Well, Giant Killer is in hand for Nassif, so manages to dodge that slithery bullet. Mm -hmm. At least for the time being, there are more comas in the deck, though. So he's going to have to find another answer for it really, really quickly. So now it's time to put your foot on the gas here, Mr. Nassif. Yeah, this is pretty sweet here from Seth. I, I'm just seeing what he's lining up right now, and mm -hmm. I am loving it. So even if we attack with Bone Crusher Giant and both Jaspera Sentinels, we we could block... We could we probably would block the three three to a Jaspera Sentinel and a one one mm -hmm. to the Bone Crusher. Let Luca go to two, and then next turn we can go a Crow and War on Bone Crusher Giant, oh. sacrifice <laughs> it to Luca, and get that other coma. Now there's oh. one train wreck situation that could happen though, Ailey, mm -hmm. and this would just be 
you know, the most devastating thing possible. If Seth draws the other coma, oh, uh, please don't don't do it to Seth. But otherwise, this play with what's going on in Nasif's hand is gonna work, and it's gonna be disgusting. Oh, I can't wait. All right, I'm here for the disgusting. Yes, One order too. of that, please. Yep, doing a quick read, seeing if he can afford to not attack it, seeing if he's willing to even trade the coma. He doesn't know about a crow in war right now. Mm -hmm. um, but Seth, I have a very good feeling, will not be taking that Bone Crusher giant off the battlefield, even if given the option. Oh, man, I'm just so excited for this next turn. It's like, uh, okay, cool, giant killers on the battlefield, no but let's start <laughs> stealing some giants, right? Yeah, no coma, no coma, no coma. That's all Seth is yeah. thinking. It's like if he draws it, it's just a train wreck. Oh, no. All right, if that happens, then we'll talk about <laughs> what do we do now? <laughs> yeah, we we cry. Cry? Uh, yeah. Roll over, cry some more. Please, no coma. Oh. Okay, good. All right, Bone Crusher Giant. That's <laughs> sweet. The Acroan Wars Chapter 2 and Chapter 3 um against the battlefield of a bunch of one twos is not ideal mm -hmm. um but it is still just such a powerful play sacrificing your opponent's creature to get some value people might remember that play a lot of standard or historic the claim the firstborn village rights kind of combo yeah. and everyone knows how bad that feels this is pretty similar except their payoff instead of drawing two cards is getting a coma onto the battlefield which yeah is a little bit it's better. like more yeah. power every single time. And what's nice about this situation, too, is that there's a 3-3 on the battlefield already, uh, so that the new coma, even if there was a chop down on upkeep for Gab Nassif, he would be able to protect it with this uh, coma coil that's already on the battlefield. So here is Coma Cosmo Serpent number two, and this is going to be a very, very tough fight for Gab Nassif to win from this point. Yeah, near, near impossible. I mean, I think what Nassif's best draw now isn't a crow in war. Um, another crow in war here is pretty strong. And I wonder, Seth only has two of the coils. So I kind of doubt he is going to start tapping lands or anything like that, especially mm -hmm. with these just spare sentinels. I, I highly doubt it. But now it seems like we got a clarion spirit. We got a showdown. And Nassif is just thinking, okay, a crow in war, a crow in war, a crow in war. <laughs> Otherwise, with two of these three threes, you cannot chop down it anymore. And these... Mm -hmm. These serpents keep coming. They do. One of these token generators is not like the other, Corey. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Coma doesn't put up flyers. <laughs> 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 oh, like no. That, right, Ailey? <laughs> of course. Yes. You read my mind. I knew it. I knew oh, it. Oh, my. Yeah, none All of those right. cards help against a coma, that's for sure. Mm mm. That does equal a lot of tokens and a lot of counters next turn, though. Does. But with both players still, you know, 17 life or higher, this go-wide strategy against a player that is cranking out six power and toughness for free every turn and then can still play is going to be really rough. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to just get this other Clarion Spirit out, though. I'm curious to see when Seth Manfield's going to start sacrificing the coils. I don't think it'll be just yet, but he, there are two abilities with the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. One being indestructible, the other one being tap no more activate nonsense from you, whatever's tapped. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, what, at what point do you think he's good to just start slamming in? Is it after this attack that's coming next turn? Yeah, I would think it's not going to be next turn because with the Crone War on Chapter 2, Gabriel Nassif is about to make a really bad attack. And these Coma <laughs> Serpents are, are going to be able to block. The mm -hmm. one good news for Nassif is Nassif with Jaspera Sentinel can actually just tap down both Clarion Spirits before yeah. combat and at least go like that. But then the turn after... Nasif is going to be relatively tapped out, can maybe play these Lovestruck Beasts, which will be untapped, maybe have a Clarion Spirit here and there. Um, that The spirit that the Clarion Spirit creates, I should say, um, yeah. as an untapped permanent. But otherwise, it's just going to be time for Seth to make a large attack next turn that could be threatening lethal. Yeah. Is there any consideration then to Fire Prophecy and Bone Crusher Giant, these Clarion Spirits, before all the shenanigans happen next turn? 
I was just thinking the same thing. And I'm like, it, if you're going to use one of those removals, mm. there's a solid chance it, it'd be better to just do it now. At least kill one of the Jaspera Sentinels. So you have to have Nasib make some bad attacks. Yeah. But instead, Seth is just valuing um, protecting against the Akroan War would be my guess. Because even if Nasib Akroan Ward coma, you can just bounce Akroan War at end step and just get mm. it back. That's not the best play compared to bouncing Coma back because they can just play a, the Akroan War the next turn. Yeah. But if they're really low on life and that attack is just going to be lethal, it's it's a play that's on the table. Okay. So here we're going to see all of the cards exiled with Shodan of the Skulls get played. First things first, let's get the Heart's Desire token on the battlefield, get a counter, and then follow up with the Love Struck Beast if... Yeah, chooses to go for that. Looks like he is going to prioritize the adventure creatures over the Gigantha or the Giant Killer. I mean, this is still a pretty clogged up battlefield here. Yes, this is a, a large battlefield and it's still going to be tough to get through. But now the one thing that kind of unclogs it is chapter two and chapter three of the Akron War. Mm -hmm. Even if you tap your clarion spirits just to... Um, just to make sure they don't die in a bad attack. They're still going to die during Seth's <laughs> uh, beginning of main phase one with chapter three of the Akron War. So it's going to clear up a bit, just showing how good these Akron Wars are in a ton of matchups. Any of these adventure matchups, they're just, that card's unreal. Yeah, so here we're going to see a couple of taps on the Despair of Sentinel, a counter go on the... Lovestruck Beast and the Giant Killer kill the opposing Lovestruck Beast on Seth Manfield's battlefield. And gonna tap here for the Giant Killer to come out as well. Yeah, that's a battlefield. And now these yeah. showdowns are, you know, making Lovestruck Beast big enough to actually block Coma. We're gonna mm -hmm. see that that's probably not gonna work the best. I, I, I think Seth has the option to just petty theft away that 7-7 seven, seven Lovestruck Beast. Um... And, and kind of clear that out. And then the only thing that can block is a one, two, four, and four one ones. And <laughs> Seth can even kill two of them. So yeah. there's only going to be three one one blockers. Um, I don't think it looks like it's going to be exactly lethal from Seth, but he's going to be in a commanding board position uh, yeah. after this turn. It's also the option to brazen borrow away the love struck beast, but that's always a feels bad, especially if they get the extra value off of the heart's desire again. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So on the end step here, just a decision from Seth Manfield. Does have a couple of two mana spells that he can fire off. And this is just still, I want to remind everyone at home, this is such a huge match. If Seth wins, pulling two points ahead of Gabriel Nassif, who's in second, versus Seth losing and them being tied is such a big difference when it comes to this league weekend with only five rounds to go. <laughs> Look at them. Quit hitting yourself. Quit hitting yourself. Quit hitting yourself. <laughs> All right, so only one of the creatures died there for Gabriel Nassif, so that's yeah. a pretty good, uh, good way to avoid... The Akroan War. But as I say that, <laughs> the next draw is an Akroan War. Yeah, Nassif really wants to see that. Another Akroan War for the fun. We'll see if we'll see if Seth even cares. He equally might just cast one removal spell um, and then like play Brazen Bar or something like that, or play a Bone mm -hmm. Crusher Giant. And you might be wondering at home, like if there's only two comas, why do we even tick up Luca? Because Luca still does have an ultimate that essentially says I win the game just in case something goes poorly. Yeah. Just every creature dealing damage to its power doesn't happen very often. Maybe like one out of a hundred games, I imagine. With it's this pretty deck spectacular when it goes off. But it is very <laughs> spectacular. Well said. We saw it at the Strixhaven uh, Championship, I believe, and oh, awesome. it was just gross. <laughs> <laughs> was that grosser or was just, you know, Sam Party taking all the turns grosser? Because um, there there's a lot always of... going to take the cake, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was some, that was an impressive <laughs> event for sure. Right. So what's the follow up here then for Seth Manfield? He hasn't been finding lands, but Lucas sure has been whiffed a second time. 
Yeah, I think he's going to take this opportunity to kill one of these large Jaspera Sentinels. Mm -hmm. Like the one on the far left of our screens here is technically a 3-4, three, three, four. Four, mm -hmm. but it has three damage dealt to it. So this is the only opportunity to stomp it or fire prophecy it uh, to just clear it up and kind of get a little bit more bang for your buck. But says, you know what? I don't really care about that. I'm just going to react to anything that matters. And right now, Coma has everything on lockdown. So doesn't care about this battlefield right now. Yeah, so it leaves up all the mana. No uh, no removal, no extra creature to the battlefield. Seth has slightly less mana to work with than uh, Gabna Seif on the other side. And a very nice draw there for Gabna Seif and the Edgewell Innkeeper. We'll be able to get some value off of it before it meets its end to a stomp or a fire prophecy. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, what you said is just spot on with only having like five lands. Seth is really playing a combo deck that just has an adventure theme. And yeah. Nassif is playing this value oriented uh, adventure deck that draws a lot more cards. So therefore you make a lot more land drops. So th Seth is like, if I can stop at five mana every game, I'm in. <laughs> I do not need seven <laughs> to actually cast Coma. Five is enough. Yeah. Don't want to see coma at all. Just don't be in my opening hand, please. Yeah, yeah, that is uh, that is the auto mulligan there right away. That's for sure. You're at least one card down. Getting to seven is uh, a little tricky. <laughs> so here's an interesting decision point. This little spirit is getting quite chunky, and uh, Seth Manfield wants none of that. So Bone Crusher Giant is going to stomp the two two. Yep. Yeah, it's just showing that Seth is prioritizing dealing with bigger creatures than getting mm -hmm. Edgewall Innkeeper off the board. He's like, you can draw as many cards as you want. You just don't have the time. So right now it's just prioritizing. If he make, if he gets a 3-3, three, three, it trades with one of the Serpents and an Edgewall Innkeeper does not, you know? Mm -hmm. So I guess just going to kill them both. Why not? Yeah, why not? It's looking pretty good here for an all-out attack, though. Gabna's use at four. There's a bunch of Serpents on the battlefield Coma can sacrifice a bunch of them, make the rest of the team tap, and then swing in for lethal. Yeah, exactly. And especially with that Crow and War to clear up one more blocker, mm -hmm. uh, this is this game's just over. Yeah, and uh, he has the opportunity to get the Giant Killers tapped too before they can tap any of his creatures on his upkeep. So things are looking really, really good here for Seth Manfield. There we go. We're on the board, it's looking like. <clears throat> All right, so Gabna Seif is just going to dump down as much value, as much power as he possibly can to try and fend off against this slithery army that Seth Manfield acquired here. Yeah, and this is a this is just going to be a game of, yeah, this, this game might not technically end next turn, but we're just really going through the motions here. The value that Seth is accruing is just too much to overcome. Now we got a 7-3-3 three, three serpent, <laughs> brazen borrower to bound something, and a crone war to steal something else. Why not? Probably yeah. the best draw. It's uh, <laughs> That should speed up the process a little bit. Yeah. Grab the 7-7. Seven, seven. Grab the 7-7. Seven, seven. Yeah. <laughs> Take the 7-7, seven, seven, bounce the 5-5, five, five, and uh, hit that beautiful button that we all love, the attack oh, yeah. all. Attack all. That's everybody's favorite button. <laughs> so Crone Except Wars the person being attacked all, of course. Yeah. Yes, yeah. No, they're, they're no fan of that. <laughs> but here comes Brazen Borrow. It's going to bounce the Jaspera Sentinel. Gabna Seif is going to give the good game and the concession. And there we go. Seth Manfield is on the board. In a 2-1 victory over Gabna Seif. Congratulations, Seth Manfield. Man, that's got to be a big relief for him. Yeah, and honestly, just that first win, you know, we've all been in a tournament where we're just not having a great tournament, and you get that first win, and you're like, okay, now I remember how to do this. I remember to put the two wins in the win column, <laughs> and now it's just everything's in the rearview mirror. Now it's Seth's, Seth's game, so nice work, yeah. Seth. Good job, Seth Manfield, and good job to uh, the, the commentary team who picked him. So, <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> I'm Don't in the lead so. so far. So, <laughs> friends, we still have plenty of magic to play this weekend. We are going to see everybody duking it out to get those two world spots per league. So, don't go anywhere. When we come back, we're going to check out Yusuke Takahashi versus Matt Sperling.
Welcome back to the final league weekend, everybody. I'm Ailey Loney alongside Corey Baumeister. And we've just seen Seth Manfield pick up his first win of the tournament, which is super duper rad indeed. A quick update for you. Reed Duke and Martin Yuza have both won as well, so they've closed the gap on Gab to just one point. So the the world's race in the MPL is very close indeed. They're not making it easy on us. They're not making it easy. A beat still my beating heart here. <laughs> <laughs> There's also another world's race going on with the rivals. So let's check in on Yuta Takahashi versus Matt Sperling. Both of them also vying for a spot. Yuta Takahashi rocking the cycling deck here wow. up against Matt Sperling's Nye Adventure. So quickly, Corey, tell us about this deck. So this deck, Cycling is just trying to cycle over and over, make these 1-1 one, one creatures with improbable lines, bump, pump up Flourishing Fox, deal some damage with Pyromancer, and then have these really over-the-top Zenith Flares to finish out the game. We saw this matchup here yesterday, I believe, with Luis Scott Vargas and Utah, and it looked bad for the Cycling. I mean, Utah, Utah really just stabilized pretty quickly, and you know, Zenith Flares and all these fairies to go yeah. over the top kind of made some easy work of that match. We'll see if uh, this is going to be similar uh, as we check out Naya Adventures. Yeah, so we just see Naya Adventures in action. Pretty similar build. Yep. We've got the annoying combination of Elite Spellbinder and Dranith Magistrate to prevent any outside of the hand shenanigans from the players. But, you know, in all, a pretty fair deck all around. Exactly. And and the exact same uh, deck as well. Matt Sperling, uh, Reed Duke, Nassif, they all tested together, built this uh, Naya Adventures list, which looks very clean, very powerful. It's doing quite well in the tournament. But Naya, or I mean, cycling is probably not exactly what they wanted to see all day. <laughs> cycling, kind of the dark horse in this tournament or yeah. in this league weekend, just uh, showing up in a fair amount of, uh, of decks and a lot of different players trusting it. So as we join this game or this match both players are at a game apiece so we're going to join in game number three to see who wins in this decider yeah absolutely and we're in the rivals league here so we do uh if we remember from the metagame cycling was the top deck nine mm -hmm. adventures only had five copies and the cycling deck had eight so a lot of rivals decided to play this and it's paying off so far yes indeed and as you can see matt sperling on 51 points is currently Ahead of the pack, 48 points for Yusu Takahashi. He's going to try and close that gap in this game here. But this is a multi five, Corey. Yikes. Ooh, boy. That's a yikes. And it's I mean, not it's... even that great of a multi five. Yeah. Like, you got to keep, you know, I don't think Yuta is considering shipping this back to four, but it's just, what do you put back here? You just got to get lucky with some cyclers. It is not great. You know, maybe there is some world where he ships it just trying to find Improbable Alliance, recognizing that that's the 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 best card in this matchup. But yeah, not uh, not what Yuta wanted to do to start uh, start his day. No, not at all. Luckily, he does have the three cyclers or the four cyclers in hand with the Fire Prophecy that can act as a cycler and a removal spell. Mm. So he's going to send back most of his hand. Oh, that's so rough. <laughs> Yeah, and nothing special here for Matt either. Two Edgewall Innkeepers has a great potential to be absolutely amazing. But as it stands right now, that's just two one mana one ones and a glass casket to deal with one of these sticky creatures. Uh, yeah. Nothing overpowered from Matt yet either. But if he draws one adventure creature, his hand looks kind of phenomenal. Yeah, unfortunately, nothing yet there for Matt Sperling. Just the two Edgewall Innkeepers, like you mentioned, and a removal spell for a potential Iron Crag Pyromancer or the Valiant Rescuer here that we see in Yusu Takahashi's hand. So he's, he's cycled his way into a pretty decent hand for the time being. But Absolutely. he's still going to be hoping to find that Improbable Alliance, a way to gum up the battlefield, ways to remove the creatures that are on the board here. So he's got a lot of work to do. Yeah, like Improbable Alliance Cycle probably would have been um, the go-to play if Yuta had the option. But now it gets a lot tougher. You play... Uh, Ice Crag Pyromancer, you play the Rescuer, and you know Matt has removal in post board where it could just be Glass Casket, and it's yeah. gone, and, and we know that he indeed does have it. So we'll see if he just also wants to just Fire Prophecy and Edgewell Innkeeper. With a Mold of Five having this many options, you got to be thankful for that at least. Yeah, I, I think he's done a really good job here of just finding the answers he needs, and I was wondering <laughs> if he was going to just do a tester with a Valiant Rescuer to just try and, you know, see... Yeah. 
if there is a removal spell in hand, because to me, the Iron Crag Pyromancer is a lot more valuable than the Valiant Rescuer would be, so... And I think the risk is is probably at its lowest. There's Glass Casket and Red Cap Melee to deal with it, but outside mm-hmm. of that, it can't get stomped, it can't get giant killered. So the less the lesser amount of removal to deal with it, and it has the higher mm-hmm. ceiling, meaning the most upside uh, if it were to stay living. Yes. Oh, man. Matt Sperling is just sitting there wishing that an adventure creature would come off the top of the library because there are three Edgewell Innkeepers. He found a glass casket, so he's able to uh, stem the bleeding a little bit from that first Valiant Rescuer. Yuta yep. Takahashi has found a second copy, though, so we'll be able to keep generating tokens that way. Yeah, the inn is kept up perfectly. You just need the people oh. to come and stay. You know, you need <laughs> the people to come and stay at the inn. Otherwise, what's the point of an inn? I know, right? <laughs> But a great draw there for Yuta Takahashi. He finds an improbable alliance and will now be able to start generating fairies along with Valiant Rescue when that comes down. Also finds a Zenith Flare, but won't be able to do anything with that until he finds that fourth oh, land. God. Oh, no. And I'm, lands are plenty for Matt Sperling. This is not what he wants to see. I was just going to say, at this point, if Matt has one more brick of a draw, just drawing absolutely horribly right now and doesn't get an adventure creature, all of a sudden, you know, that that advantage bar that was slammed over to Matt's side with those mulligans to five on the play is definitely coming back to Utah's side, and he might even be favored in this already. Yeah, it's it's looking really, really good here for you, Takahashi, just finding what he needed off the top of the library, has removal spells now for one of these Edgewell Innkeepers if he needs it. And yeah. you can see Matt Sperling is not happy, just a shake of the head with these draws. But if he can hang in there, he is sorted in terms of card draw for the next turn. Yeah, absolutely. And I uh, I would have 100% kept the hand that Matt kept as well, especially with Utah mulliganing. You know, you at least know he's mulliganing to six right away. And just sometimes that's magic. You know, your deck doesn't yeah. agree with you. And the best thing you can draw is one glass casket, one innkeeper. And then from that point on has drawn four lands. You know, yeah. that that is that is awful. Yeah, you just found a, a big chunk of lands now too, but does have the Zenith Flare to deal with the 5-5 five, five on the battlefield. So he is just putting foot now. He's like, I have more creatures than you. You're not blocking with your Edgewell Innkeepers. But there, finally, is the adventure creature. Bone Crusher Giant can take care of one of these critters, or he can just play it straight away to see if we can get another adventure creature off the top here. Okay, another showdown's land. not bad. That was showdown. a smart play by Sperling there to not stomp. Normally, you want to just get any kind of value here, but yeah. if you stomp, you cannot play another three mana adventure creature or a showdown. And Matt did get the showdown. And at this point, you know how I was saying this whole time, you really want to maximize it where you don't want to play a land first. Mm-hmm. That doesn't apply when all you're drawing is lands. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Wow. Redane. Uh, yeah, I, I'm starting to think it might not be Redain that we're going to see on no, this battlefield, Ailey. What do you think? Oh, my goodness. Yuta's going to have to, oh, he's going to have to hope for Zenith Flares because if that shield lands, all of these attackers become redundant. They're just zero ones, effectively. Yeah. Yeah, it prevents one damage, but a very important distinction. It's one damage per creature. So one ones uh-huh. are really not where it's at and also just makes it tricky to target. It's a very, very tough card to play against the backside of Redain. Oh my goodness me. All right. So not much else going. There's five lands that Matt Sperling can cost or that he can play. <laughs> so... <laughs> Let's get one of them down. Sure, why not? Cool. Yeah, so far these decks usually play around 22, 23 lands. Matt has 13 of them already in hand or graveyard. My goodness. That is not ideal. Not ideal at all. With only a third of his deck gone. So getting half of your lands in only a third of your draws is definitely below average. Mm-hmm. Here comes Velk Mira. The shield that causes all <laughs> the stress for Yuzu Takahashi now. He can have as many creatures as he likes. They're not going to do anything. Yep, 100%. And just having all of these, just these creatures at three toughness right now, 
even if Yuta cycles this, which he definitely will to make another token because he's already drawn one card, a probable alliance will trigger here. Mm -hmm. Even if you can't even triple block that bone crusher giant. Nope. Yeah. You can, he's effectively just making chump blockers now until yep. he can wrap up this game with the Zenith Flare. So he's yep. going to be praying to the magic gods right now for a top deck here. And don't get me wrong, the Zenith Flare is going to be extremely good. I don't know exactly the count we're at right now. Okay, it's ten. That was uh, that was easy to answer. Yep. Uh, and we're we're close to finishing it already. Ten is actually nine with the shield in play. But the one thing that is going very well for Yuta here is he got to get in that chip shot damage to put Matt down mm -hmm. to twelve. If Matt if Matt would have drawn this adventure creature earlier and was able to get this oh. shield down a couple turns, like yeah. And there's not much Matt can do to the Zenith Flare when it gets to this stage. Mm -mm. He was hyped about that, but it's going to be some bad news once he yeah. sees double Zenith Flare. Bad news bears are coming. Luckily, uh, Yuta can't fire them both off in the same turn. Yep. But just being able to fire it off on the end step and then on an upkeep, it's I, I, I don't know if Matt can win this right now. Yeah, and you saw Matt just raise his eyebrows, as I just did, too. That's land number 15 and 16 in yes. his 22-23 land deck. That's just, it's just unbelievable. Good grief. Yeah, and we're going to see all these attackers, even if Utah were to just take it, you know, maybe taking 7, 8, 9, 10 damage tops with all these showdown triggers, even if you just take it, next turn, you just draw, you gain 9, you go back up to 19, yeah. and then all of a sudden Matt has to deal 19 this turn, or he's going to die, and it's just, it's a tall order. Yeah, for sure. He can get the counters on these creatures, he can swing in with everything, but fact of the matter is, these blockers, if if Yusa chooses to block, they're just a brick wall that he can't get through. Exactly. Ooh, boy. So just uh, getting as much value down on the battlefield as he can at the moment. Getting as many counters on all these creatures as he possibly can to try and force through as much damage. And don't forget, got to get that Tangled Florhedron down to get one extra green mana for next turn. Very mm -hmm. important. <laughs> yes, because mana is certainly what Sperling needs right now. Problem. Yep. Yep. Yeah, really unfortunate draw from Matt to just have his sand hand really set up with just one adventure creature with all those innkeepers. And it was just a few turns too many late. And now Utah knows yeah. it as well. There's not much that Matt can do. It's not like these team or Luka decks, you know, that have some disdainful strokes or have mm -hmm. some of these plans to deal with these Zenith flares. Even, you know, Solta Ultimatum will play some counter spells. Nye Adventures doesn't have that luxury. No. It's all in on big chunky dudes on the battlefield swinging in and making your dead as quick as they can. But one thing that this deck, like you mentioned, doesn't have the access to is counter magic. So mm. it will die here for Matt Sperling, unfortunately. So as it stands, Yusu Sakahashi will win this game of three here between these two players, taking him within two points of Matt Sperling. Yep, this kind of game right now, if we were at the playtesting table getting ready for one of these events, you'd just kind of show the hand and be like, yeah, all right, you win, you know? <laughs> but but now that we're at League Weekend, it is, uh, you go through all the motions and you maximize your play, which yep. we're going to see Matt do because he is an elite player and he's going to make sure every play is as tight and as technical as possible, but it's unfortunately still going to meet the same result no matter what he does. Yeah. And Utah is just kind of hanging out there. It was like, okay, yep. that's fine. You can do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fire Prophecy, Bone Crusher Giant, another Love Struck Beast, and another Shodan of the Skull. So, you, I mean, you look at this hand. If there was if there was one Zenith Flare in Utah's hand, I would be like, okay, Matt's in with a shot. He just needs to put yep. foot and go, right? But ugh, it's that's just an impossible situation right now. Yeah, if it was one Zenith player, I'd be like, well, Utah is in a position where, 
he has to draw another one or it's game in favor of Matt. You know, yeah. having double Zenith flare there was excellent. I guess if Yuta did only have one, his plan would have been a little different. He just would have been, you know, activating Improbable Alliance, cycling, and then just hope one Zenith flare wins in a couple of turns. So the game would have looked a little different, but probably still favored in Yuta's, even if there was only the one, just with Matt already being at 12. Yeah. All right, so one more Love Struck Beast. Heart's Desire down on the battlefield, and here we're going to see the first of the two Zenith Flares fired off at Matt's face. Yeah, there was there was Matt's out, is that Yuta accidentally hit cancel on that uh, shield trigger. But yeah, the <laughs> second one's going to do it. And there's the good game from Matt's burning. So Yuta Takahashi with the cycling deck picks up the win there and closes the gap with Matt Sperling to just two points.